Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is Tuesday. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I hope you spent a lot of time reading. I hope you did whatever it is that makes you happy on the weekends. I can't remember what happened on my weekend. I'm sure I had one. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? When suddenly it's it's only two days after the weekend and you're like, huh, I have no idea what I did. I, I did laundry. Does that count? I mean, yeah, there you go. Let's not talk about laundry. Let's talk about books. One book in particular. I am speaking today with author Jason Graff about his novel, Stray Our Pieces. Gloria Hintner has managed to raise a son intelligent and sensitive enough to be the prime target of the neighborhood bully. David seeks solace from her, but her acerbic wit is all she can pass on to him. She had once been well on her way to becoming a crusading attorney, but a personal tragedy forced her to drop out of law school. Now stuck in her dreary suburban existence, she struggles to even fantasize about escape until the day David unexpectedly exacts revenge on his bully, giving Gloria the courage to set herself free. Family ties are not broken so much as stretched into something new in Stray Our Pieces. So that is the description of Stray Our Pieces by Jason Graff. One thing that Jason says in the interview that I really liked um, was that this is a coming-of-age novel, but he wanted it to look at a coming-of-age novel instead of from the perspective of, in this case, David, the the son, the young man in the book. He wanted to look at it from the perspective of the parent, uh, again, in this case, Gloria, David's mother. Because often in coming of age novels, the parents are either kind of non-existent or they're just there as the catalyst for the coming of age journey. And so Jason wanted to really see what having your child come of age, having your child have some sort of significant life changing experience or an experience that changed maybe the trajectory of their life up to that point, how that affects the parent. So that is what this novel is about. It's about Gloria being um, a parent, being somewhat disillusioned, dissatisfied with her life, not feeling terribly motherly at the beginning, um, not feeling very connected in a lot of ways in her relationships. It's a book about relationships. It is a book about complex relationships, the the layers that exist within our relationships with each other, especially with family and how we interact with family. Um, again, especially with family through generations. So there is Gloria's relationship with her son. There is Gloria's husband, David's father, Daryl's relationship with their son. There's Gloria's relationship with her mother and the experiences that um, she had growing up that have affected her currently. So it's this sort of cascading effect as we often see in families where one generation influences the next, which influences the next. And there's always ev- evolution, hopefully, and growth. And each generation learns a little and grows a little, moves in a different direction. But those prior generations, those those relationships definitely affect how we interact with the world. And so there's a lot of exploration of 
those kinds of themes in this book. So we are going to go ahead and turn now to that interview with Jason. I do have copies of this book to give away. So if you are interested in um, entering the giveaway to win a copy of Stray Our Pieces by Jason Graff, stay tuned until the end of the episode and I'll tell you how to go about entering that giveaway. In the meantime, as I said, let's turn to the interview with Jason. Hi, Jason. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I am very happy to have you here. We are going to talk about your book. It is called Stray Our Pieces. Before we get to the book, though, if you could um, share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Uh, Well, I live in uh, Richardson, Texas, with my wife, son, and our cats. Um, And we moved down here in 2017 after basically living uh, almost, well, our entire lives together were on the East Coast. And I lived north of the Mason-Dixon and and east of the Mississippi for my entire life. As a matter of fact, this is only the second time I've actually been this far west. I was in Los Angeles for a week once about uh, 20 years ago now. So moving here was is a bit of a shock. Um, but we're adjusting and, and, you know, finding there's a lot of things to like about Texas. And, uh, you know, we're still still adjusting, as I said. I don't know that we're full-fledged Texans yet, but... Um, no, they probably wouldn't consider you full-fledged yet, but <laughs> you're, you're no, getting there. No, I, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, as I said, the book is called Stray Our Pieces. If you could give um, a quick overview of the story. Um, the story is basically about, um, you know, a woman who, over the course of about nine or ten months, decides that she's going to uh, uh, leave behind the life that she's led so far and try to find something new for herself. She's become dissatisfied um, in her marriage um, um, and and finds she's no longer able to connect with her son, who's uh, becoming a young man. He's, you know, about to enter his teenage years. And she finds herself uh, kind of stuck in a place she never imagined she'd be and doesn't want to be and slowly realizes over the course of the book um, a, a, a lot of it has to do with the actions of her son, following the actions of her son, inspiring her to to, to break out of the life that she's living, and and, uh, and uh, try to chart a new course for herself. Yeah. Um, so, what was your initial inspiration for this story? Um, initially, I had started writing about something terrible that had happened in my neighborhood. Um, in, in Stray Our Pieces, there's a there's a character who has some developmental challenges, and um, I had originally started writing about someone in my neighborhood who um, had had challenges uh, of, of a similar nature, um, who had been um, assaulted, and uh, and it was this kind of this long buried secret in our neighborhood where no one really talked about it, and I decided that was an interesting thing to write about, um, but when it came time to really get to the hard work of writing, uh, and and really get into the the kind of the shocking event and everything, I realized I didn't really have um, enough information. And then when I talked to my mother about it, I realized I didn't have the right information. So from that point, I kind of switched switched tracks and decided to tell, you know, a, a different a different kind of story that was, I guess, tangentially related about, um, it started out being about the sun. And then I thought, this seems like every other coming of age novel that's ever been written. So I thought it was kind of interesting to do this kind of coming of age novel from the perspective of the mother um, because the parents in those books always tend to be, you know, either non-existent or barriers or just they tend to not be very helpful because that's where your conflict comes from. So I thought it would be interesting to attempt to, as I said, write that kind of coming of age story from a mother's perspective. Hmm, Interesting. And speaking of the mother, her name is Gloria. Uh, What about her and her journey do you think will resonate with readers? You know, I think a lot of her, uh, because she sort of in her way comes into herself through the course of the book. Um, I think, you know, I think that society, one of her big problems, one of her struggles is there is a different standard when it comes to being a parent for a man than there is for a woman. Um, and this is both su- um, suggested um, subtextually throughout the book, but also in a particular scene, she, you know, makes the statement. And so I think that, you know, I, I, a lot of times I think society, we, we are branded or we're put into these roles by society 
that don't always fit us quite so neatly. And I think that, you know, anybody who, and this is probably everybody at one time or another, feels kind of trapped by the role society has, has given them, will find um, something familiar in glorious struggles and conflicts. And you yourself are a parent, so you brought that perspective into it. What were, no, were actually, there challenges? No, actually, I didn't. I wrote this, I wrote this before uh, oh. my son came into my life. Okay. I actually okay. finished writing this, and you know, I think I had finished completely working on it um, a few months before he actually came into my life. Okay. Um, oh. Then it was. Then it took time for me to, you know, take the book to a- agents and publishers, and I was getting nibbles, so I knew I was on the right track, and people would want exclusives with it. And then, you know, before you know it, a couple of years have elapsed of, you know, so many close calls before I found a publisher for it. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of funny at that time. I really had no idea what it was like to be a parent. And uh, I just tried to imagine uh, what it was like being my parent, I guess. Okay, um, so, because um, David's kind of similar to, to me, as, as who, who I was growing up. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about that experience of writing uh, the role of a parent and a a female parent from a male non-parenting position. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Jason Graff. Before the break, we were talking about the role of parents and writing as a parent, writing this coming of age story from the parent's perspective. So let's go ahead now and get back to that conversation with Jason Graff. So did you try to imagine specifically your your mom? I mean, because, okay, so you're not a parent and you're, you know, I'm not a mom, I would think. <laughs> how How was it writing from that perspective for you? You know, I tried to imagine my mother and, you know, some exes of, of relationships that I've had throughout my life and, uh, you know, just what their view would be of, because I really was this kid who cried a lot, you know. I was this really sensitive, um, gawky. I wasn't nearly as, as studious or as well read as David is in the book. Um, but I was, you know, sensitive and bullied and I just try to imagine, um, <clears throat> what that would be like dealing with that, dealing with that situation as a parent for over the years. And, um, I don't think my mother is not very much like Gloria at all, but I, I tried to imagine Gloria as someone who begins to be kind of come ground down by this needing to be, needing to buoy her, her son and try to find a way to give him confidence and, you know, figure it out. And uh, right. then I then I now that I have a son, I can attest it is it is exhausting being a parent. It's emotionally exhausting. Absolutely. And Gloria does not really have um, much support. She does not have a, a great marriage and um, her uh, her husband is not much of a co-parent. So she really is dealing with this on her own, plus trying to figure out, you, you know, her life and her marriage and her place in the world. Um, so there is a lot of, I guess, just figuring out going on through her story. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that her, I think her husband's one of these guys and I I don't think this is an unusual, uh, problem. I mean, we don't have it at our house. Um, but I, I think that he wants to be the good guy more than be 
the the parent. And I don't think that's an uncommon problem in in co-parenting situations where, and I think it's all too often that the man wants to be the friend or the buddy of the son and not really the the father, the disciplinarian, and all the, kind of the the dirty work of being a parent gets passed on to the mother. Right, right. So um, the relationships in this book are, you know, like life, complicated. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the family dynamics, um, especially between Gloria and David, but just also in general? I, the way that I thought of it is I think David is a lot more like uh, uh, Daryl wishes he could have been. I think Gloria's husband, I I because he, he did have, you know, dreams of becoming an artist in the book. That's that's something that is discussed. And I think that it, had he grown up in a different time, I think he would have been much more like David um, as a young boy. I think he would have been bullied, and I think he would have been, uh, you know, I mean, he may have been bullied, but I think he was he was a very sensitive kid. He was a very sensitive kid. I don't have to think. I've created the character, so I can say he definitely was. Uh, that's how I imagine him as the sensitive character, um, artistic, uh, artistic in nature, and uh, so. He he's a lot more like Daryl uh, would have been if Daryl had been born in a different time. And I think that you know, I, uh, Gloria wants people to be a lot simpler than they turn out to be. I think that she's someone who, you know, a lot of the book is her talking about how a person is, and then a person acting in a way that kind of um, confounds those expectations. You know, like I think her relationship with her mother, she looks at it one way, but then you begin to see through the conversations and how her mother is that her mother in her own way is trying to be supportive of Gloria. And she shares the same dreams Gloria once had for her life. And so that's kind of one of the, <clears throat> one of the driving forces of the novel. The conflict is this Gloria wanting to see people in kind of this two-dimensional way these other characters but they turn out to be a little bit more complicated than maybe she's able to deal with and i think that's one of her failings in the relationship is uh you know being able not unable to see her son in his fullness or her husband in his fullness and not being able to give that then you know in turn to them yeah as and a person. um i'm i'm glad you brought up uh gloria's mother because you know on the surface you see oh well it's just one more dysfunctional relationship but and when you delve a little deeper, you see that there is the, there are those threads running through the book of um, kind of missed opportunities or dreams that didn't come to fruition. And so Gloria's relationship with her mother is affected by that. David's relationship with his father is affected by that. There's there's that definite theme running through that. Yeah, you know, like I said, I think we... We do, I think just everybody does this. We, we of, of our nature... of just naturally project who we think someone should be, whether it's our parents or our children. And they're never going to be that, that individual that you have this idealized, not even idealized, this imagined version of, because everybody obviously has this, you know, tumultuous inner life that we're all dealing with, you know, our own baggage all the time. And I think when people come into conflict a lot of times, it's because they fail to understand that, you know, people are trying to be supportive often. It just seems to us to be insufficient because we expect more from them than they're able to give, or we don't. We expect something different from them. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, you know, we only see through our own experiences. So putting yeah. ourselves in other people's other people's shoes, being empathetic, that can be you know, various levels of difficulty, difficult depending on your personality, your family of origin, all of those different factors. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's in, in, in terms of literature, I think that's one of the great um, advantages of first person narratives is that, that, you know, you have this inherent conflict between how the other characters are seen by the, the narrator and how they appear on the page. I mean, if, if done correctly, every first person narration should be somewhat unreliable right right because you're only getting one viewpoint of the story yeah yeah uh, in terms of um the, the writing process did you do uh, particular research for the book 
Uh, yeah, you know, I certainly had to go back and try it again because of when it's set kind of in the, you know, the late 90s through like tw 2012 or so, that getting, you know, those kind of period details, like I had to go back and look, you know, when certain songs would have been out and, and what, you know, where certain neighborhoods of New York would have been kind of gritty and just try to get enough, enough research to get, just give a, a plausible background to it. Um, because I don't come out and say, you know, in, I, I, I've, although I do, I think I actually do once or twice, but I don't really come out and say when it's set. So I need to make sure like there's a new year's Eve scene. So, I mean, I need to make sure Dick, Dick, Dick Clark was still, you know, alive and, and, you know, active in that. So just sort of very, not, not, there was no deep research. It was basically, you know, Googling. <laughs> <laughs> just to find dates and, and to, to make sure the pieces all fit. Right. And um, in terms of the time period, um, I knew reading it that it was not exactly current, but it wasn't, you know, you're, you're trying to figure things out by the clues. And, and toward the end, um, Gloria gets a cell phone or David insists that she get a cell phone, uh, a certain kind of cell phone. And you're like, oh, okay, so things that took place before this were not in the era of that particular cell phone. So it's, it's like a little, uh, scavenger hunt to figure out what time period it is I, I wanted to intentionally write in a time slightly before cell phones became you know so ubiquitous because you know they tend to confound a lot of of uh you know narrative situations that uh that uh you might want to craft because there's always like oh why shouldn't she just text about this or you know what i mean like mm -hmm. she can check this online on her phone Right. And then yeah, having her have to go to the computer and look up, you know, look for jobs that way. And like I said, it gave me it gave me more opportunity to do. There are certain things in the book without giving too much away that I wanted to be able to to play with without having an easy solution be. Oh, why does she just, you know, look this up or text this person now or you know what I mean? Yeah, right. It, it's definitely a different dynamic depending on the technology available. Yeah. Um, are there any autobiographical elements in the book you've mentioned that david's a little bit like you were growing up um anything else in the story or the location or the characters you know the location is definitely i oh you know i was saying this to my wife the other day i always end up writing about the house that i grew up in and other than like the wood stove on the first level it basically is the house that i grew up in and so i think that you know I, I have trouble getting away from that floor plan, plan for whatever reason. I mean, I mean, obviously because just it's just you know it's easy to to uh, to put yourself kind of in that in that house that you spent you know I spent 17, 18 years in it. Um, so the house that they grew up in in the neighborhood with the long streets and the kind of the the park that's fallen into disrepair. Those are all definitely locations from my childhood that it was very easy to place myself in and and uh, easily grab the details that I needed to kind of fill in the background for the reader. Um, and as I said, the Sarah, the character who's developmentally challenged is based on someone who I knew and, uh, you know, hung out with when we were, we, when I was younger. Time now to take our second and final break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be speaking a little bit more about this idea or concept of writing your childhood home and the advantages therein. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Jason Graff, author of Stray Hour Pieces. Before the break, we were talking about how he always ends up seeming to write his childhood home into his books. And so we are going to continue that conversation. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. I actually spoke with an author um, a couple months ago, maybe now, and she was saying kind of the same thing about setting the the story in the house that she grew up in simply because she didn't have to think if somebody needed to turn left to go to the bathroom or, you know, those sorts of things. So I, I would imagine that makes at least one part of the process just a little bit less. Um, you just don't have to think about it as much, you know, trying to figure out the floor plan, et cetera. Well, I find my problem is, you know, it's often that I just start creating this space for my characters to move around in and just for subconscious reasons, I guess, that it's my house. You know, I don't know why, but that's what it always ends up being. It's just my house Mm -hmm. that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and I think, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons behind that. I think that, you know, obviously you're more comfortable there. and But, you know, you spend so much of time in the story worried about the relationships between characters that kind of relationship between the characters and the space they move around in becomes like a little bit more than I can really handle or think about when I'm drafting a novel. So that's why I tend to fall back into just, and it's only when I'm done that I'm like, Oh geez, it's my house. (laughs) This is the, this is the same house in every story I've written. It's always the same, like I said, the same floor plan, basically. Mm -hmm. Although my backyard was nicer than the the backyard in this house. (laughs) I can say that. Yeah. And we had two cars. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's only one car in this book. So yeah, I mean, yeah, basically the the house and the neighborhood are the key kind of, you know, biographical facts that I included. Okay. In the acknowledgments at the beginning of the book, you say that the title is in reference to a song um from the lyrics of the song Love You by Sid Barrett. Um why did you choose this particular title and you know, is there something about that song particularly that speaks to you or can you talk a little bit about the title? Yeah, you know, I mean I, I remember this yeah, you know, I remember this moment very well when I had finished the draft of the story. And it's very hard because you know as soon as that's done you want to start imagining it on bookshelves and imagine doing something like what I'm doing right now, you know, talking to people about it. And it is impossible to conjure those fantasies if you don't have a title. And so I finished writing it. I realized I don't have a title. And uh, so I go out into my living room. Uh, I was living in New Jersey at the time. I go out of my living room and uh, I'm like, I see that there's this Sid Barrett record that I have and that I've been listening to. And I was like, all right, give me a title. And I put the record down and I just sat there and listened for the first phrase that really jumped out at me. And um, I think that phrase occurs about two thirds of the way through the song, Love You. And it just was like, yeah, that's it. Stray Art Pieces. That's it. That's exactly what oh, I'm wow. going to title the book. Oh, that's and, fascinating. Uh, and I figured somebody would change it or recommend that I change it. And so when I didn't, I found I learned that I have to get permission. And so I was kind of sweating it out because now I'm kind of attached to this title now that I'm using it. So I had to contact his. Um, his publisher in, in, in England, in London, and get their permission. And they were, you know, very nice to let me use it without, you know, any kind of uh, fee attached. So I was just in a room. I mean, he's a, an important uh, figure in my life. Like, I've always loved his music since I was younger. So it kind of feels gratifying to, you know, be, you know, even so tangentially attached to his legacy in this way is, is very gratifying. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That is, that's really interesting. Are there um, any of your other writings that you would like to highlight during our time together? Well, I have a novella out for uh, fans of uh, Dracula called In the Service of the Boy R. It's the hard copies In the Service of the Boy R, and now there is a Kindle version, which has been repackaged and titled The White Wolf's Secret. And it is about a... Uh, the workers who dig the earth from beneath Dracula's castle for transport to England and what happens to them uh, over the course of the time that they're hired by Dracula before. And then when he returns to, and is eventually killed, spoiler alert, he's killed 
uh, on his homeland. So um, that came out in 2016, and it's available, you know, at Amazon. And um, uh, you can uh, look me up, I think, on Goodreads, uh, Jason Graff, and uh, learn more about it there. And I have a book coming out. Um, let's see, this is going to be out on Tuesday. So it's, a, it's a, a week from Monday, a week from the 13th on the 20th of January. My next book, Heckler, is being uh, pr published by Unsolicited Press. And it's about um, uh, this decaying uh, hotel in the Rust Belt where these characters' lives uh, kind of come together over a two-year period and break apart. And uh, that's something I actually started working on before Stray Our Pieces, but it's coming out afterwards just because of the the uh, way the publishing industry works, I guess is the way to explain it. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be coming out uh, about a week from now. When you think about your personal writing style, you've got the you've got the 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 Dracula related story um, about the workers, which sounds kind of creepy and fascinating. You, you've got Strayer Pieces that's very relationship and character driven. Um, do you, would you consider yourself to have a certain genre that you prefer to write in or do you write what the story, you know, whatever story it is that is wanting to be told? You know, I, I write a lot of literary fiction, but I like doing genre stuff. I do have um, some science fiction out there actually at uh, there's a very short piece of science fiction that I wrote at Quarterly, the magazine Quarterly West, that you can find online. And, uh, you know, I, I guess literary fiction is my chosen genre, but I'd, I'd rather be able to just write whatever I want to write and then let somebody figure out what genre it's in. Are you working on anything now? I mean, I know that this one came out in October, is that correct? Yeah, this one came out uh, in October. Okay, and Heckler's then the new coming one's coming out this month. In a week. Are and you working, I am on working on anything else? On yeah, I'm working on a novel right now about a uh, the yet-to-be-titled. I have like seven different titles for my uh, wife to choose from after she reads it. So hopefully one of them will will uh, be the one that she chooses. But um, it's about a uh, a romancing con man who um, basically begins relationships with older women in order to rob them. And it's about, you know, how his actions affect all the people in his life and how he came to be that, that person. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I always say, I think I'm finished with it. So it's probably like, I know another year away from being done. Okay. I don't, I hope to be done with it in the spring, but we'll see. Right. And um, this time you have seven different titles, so you're not locked into the one. That you hopefully no, you don't I have might to have change. to put on, I might have to put on a record and see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. I like it. That could be, you know, that could be your thing. How you choose uh, book titles is just by whatever record you're listening to at the moment. I eventually I'll have to pay for it. I think. I eventually I'll have. To I, pay think so. that, but... I think so. I think so. When did you start writing? Is it something that you've always wanted to do? Is it something you always have done? What's been your process? I think it's the only thing I've I've done even reasonably well in my life. I started when I was. I wrote poems for um, years and years, starting when I was like 13 or 14, you know, and then I was into like basically song lyrics and Jim Morrison and like Elizabeth, uh, you know, Browning Barrett or Barrett Browning, excuse me, and uh, uh, Emily Dickinson and, you know, those, those kind of poets, kind of, you know, the, the ones you learn in school, basically, the ones you're taught in school. And um, so I wrote poetry, like I said, starting when I was 13 or 14. And uh, I, it's the only thing I really thought of doing with my life. I don't know. I don't really, I didn't really have a conception. I was really immature, I think, throughout school. I didn't really have a conception that I was working towards a career. I knew that you had to do schoolwork and that I liked writing poetry. And the two didn't really seem to cross over that often. And many times when I was supposed to be doing my homework, I would be in there writing, you know, my, my little love phones. So, uh, it's, I mean, I guess in terms of a career, it's the only thing that I've seriously considered having a career in though. I didn't, I never really expected to do it as a job, I guess. It's the only thing I really love doing, I guess is probably the short answer. 
Okay. Um, so if you didn't really see yourself having this as a job, how did you come to that place where you're now writing for publication? Well, I had jobs where I could write that were, you know, shall we say, uh, light workloads that they didn't pay terribly much, but I could write. And so I could, you know, kind of do this thing where I could convince myself, like, I'm being paid to write. It's not, it's nothing official, but that's what I'm being paid to do. You know, I would just, I'd write after work. I'd write on the weekends. You know, it's not, it's something that I've always done in one, um, you know, form or fashion. I mean, since I was 13 or 14. So it was never really difficult for me to figure out how, how I'm going to make the time to do it. Because it always seemed to be something that I was doing anyway. I would find time for anyway. So, um, and in terms of the novels, I, uh, when I moved to, we moved to New Jersey in 2012 and I started, you know, um, teaching, uh, there. And so I had a lot more time kind of off that enabled me to really sort of do it more full time or do it more consistently. And that's when I really started to get kind of sharpen my skills a bit, get good and see that maybe this is something that might lead to, you know, to getting books published. I had no idea when or how, but, um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, something I've always done and, uh, getting published and all that seems to be kind of the kind of verification you get, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, uh, if, if I, if it hadn't happened, it wouldn't have stopped. I would still do it. Mm -hmm. And so out of that experience in your own personal journey to becoming a, a published author, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Uh, yeah, you know, you got to read a lot. And I think, I mean, everybody says that, right? You got to read. But I think more importantly, you have to read and know why it is you like to read what you like to read and know why you don't like to read the things that you that you don't like to read. And be able to come up with some kind, even if it's only for yourself, you don't have to write it down, but some kind of thesis statement um, that explains that difference. And I think that will kind of keep you on track to being the kind of writer you want to be. In terms of reading, then, since you, you brought that up, what are your go-to genres or authors when you read for yourself? Um, I read mostly uh, literary fiction, although I do read poetry and nonfiction and science fiction. And I, I used to always say, because I've done a couple of these interviews now, and I always find myself saying a Nabokov is my go-to writer. Although, to tell you the truth, I haven't read anything of his in years. I guess I should amend that and say right now it's probably Anita Bruckner or John Banville. I love both of them. Um, but I'm, I'm, I always try to mix what I'm reading so I don't read just all current stuff um, and try to read some stuff from, you know, 30, 40 years ago just to kind of mix it up and make sure I'm not um, just trying to mimic whatever the, the sound, the, the, the word of the day is. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. I just try to read, read read widely, and I'm always basically what I look for. I like I like a writer with a strong voice. I do prefer mm -hmm. um, that uh, <clears throat> the voice be you know um, like almost like the writer talking to you like a friend. That's that's what I look for, I guess, in uh, in fiction. And how about when you uh, read with your son? Are there particular books that you like to read with him? Uh, yeah, you know, he loves, I like to read anything with him and we read stories every night and, uh, he loves like these little critter books, the Mercer Mayer books. I love those books. And yeah, they're great. And he loves Pete the Cat. We read a lot of Pete the Cat and Splat the Cat. We have a cat, so there's a lot of cat related fiction that I, that I'm now exposed to. <laughs> um, um, because he is obsessed with cats, so we read like. The, I mean, the only thing I don't like to read with him are kind of the, the books that are you know. Made from like TV shows, like he likes the PJ Masks. I'm sure you don't know what they are. And, uh, I'm uh, familiar with it. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so those those books, I hate to say it, are usually not very good. Any of those shows based on – mostly the books based on cartoons are not very good or based on a movie. Um, but, yeah, I think the Little Critter books, the Mercer Meyer books, are our are number one go-to um, book right now. Although Pete the Cat is, is hot on the heels of the Little Critter, I would say, at this moment. <laughs> nice. Thank you for that. Um, I know you have a website, so can you tell people where they can find your website as well as where they can find you if you have social media or uh, any any places they can contact you in that way? Yeah, I'm at uh, Jason Graff, J-A-S-O-N-G-R-A-F-F dot WordPress dot com is my website, um, which is very Spartan, shall we say. I mean, you get the most basic information. I probably tweet more than anything at Jason Graff one. And then I also have a Facebook page author, Jason Graff and uh, Jason Graff one Twitter and Facebook respectively. Okay. Thank you for that. Is there anything that we have not talked about that you were hoping to cover or that you might be asked uh, during our time together? Not that I can think of right now. No. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about your book. And um, it's it's been a real pleasure talking to you about your writing and uh, specifically this book, Stray Our Pieces. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you once again to Jason for joining me to talk about his book, Stray Our Pieces. His new book, Heckler, does come out soon, so if you're interested, you should definitely check that out. If you are interested in winning a copy of Stray Our Pieces, you can enter on our social media pages, uh, GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Just comment on this post. It's episode 209, Interview with Jason Graff, and tell me in your comment um, what album you would put on to find the title of your next book uh what's your what's what's your go-to album that you would get the title of your book from again gsmc book review facebook twitter or instagram just comment on this post of course you can like and follow and do all of those wonderful things as well but in order to enter the giveaway you do need to comment in order to um win a uh, possibly win a copy of this book. Speaking of social media, as always, if you are a fan of this podcast and you would like other readers to be able to find it, it would really help us out if you could, again, follow us and do all those wonderful social media things, retweet, share, etc. But if you could also give us a five-star review, that would be lovely. If you want to write a review, that's also great. But subscribe and follow, and uh, it really does help. So thank you in advance for all of those wonderful things you can do to help us build up our internet presence. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, for joining me every week to talk about books, to talk with authors. I hope you are having, uh, as I said, a wonderful week, and I hope that your week involves, as always, the chance to get lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.